1995 NASCAR Winston Cup season brought the reemergence of the dominant Chevrolet Monte Carlo, the return of one of the sport's great heroes, and a points battle between a young buck and the stern old champion that went down to the final race. You'll see it all here on the 1995 NASCAR Year in Review. Hello, everybody. I'm Eli Gold. Welcome to the 1995 NASCAR Year in Review. And boy, what a racing season it was. The on-track competition was outstanding, and it all began right here back in February at Daytona International Speedway. But even before they dropped the very first green flag, the story of the year was the return of the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Remember in 1994, the Monte Carlo's predecessor, the Chevy Lumina, won only 11 races. The Fords won 20 times. Well, after three years on the drawing board and one year of on-track testing, the Chevrolet engineers were confident that their brand new downforce package would prove to be downright unbeatable. The big story of the 1995 NASCAR Winston Cup preseason, the Chevrolet Monte Carlo, the revitalization of an old warhorse for the Bowtie Brigade. The first glimpse of the 95 version comes at Talladega, where a couple of Chevy teams come for early season testing in January. I guess we've been working on the car now a little over two years. You know, uh, Neil Bonnet did the very first test for us up in Michigan a couple of years ago, and uh, we seen then the car had some potential, but there's been a lot of work and a, and a lot of man hours put into it. They've been, uh, you know, working on a long time, and uh, it's finally coming out, you know, last year. At, you know, we kind of hope we can get it out, but, uh, you know, they just waited this year to break it out. And, uh, you know, like I said, I think it'll be a good race car for us, and uh, we'll just see what happens. Meanwhile, in much warmer Daytona, the headline story is the Robert Yates Ford piloted by Dale Jarrett, by far the fastest Ford in both test sessions at the World Center of Racing. Jarrett is the early favorite to win the pole for the Daytona 500. It's been a lot of fun knowing that you're the fastest, and, and I know that Robert and, and Larry haven't done anything that's out of the ordinary or something that we can't do here when we come back. So, uh, you know, the speeds normally are a little bit slower when you come back anyway after the 24-hour and all of that, but uh, I believe we can still handle it. But another story looms over the 28 car as Ernie Irvin remains a big part of the team. So how does the relationship of Irvin, the consultant, and Jarrett, the driver, work out? Ernie understands the situation. He wants us to go out and win races. Awful tough situation, but he wants us to win races and uh, for a car to be there when he does get back. And You know, sometime later this year, Ernie may be racing Dale to the victory. That well, wouldn't be bad. We'll figure out how to handle that. And I hope that could happen later this year. Despite Jarrett dominating the top of the speed charts throughout testing and several Monte Carlos being awfully close, it's the Pontiac of Michael Waltrip that surprises everyone with his winter best run of 192.802 miles an hour. We're, we've been fast in preseason testing a couple of times before and couldn't really repeat it, but uh, this, is, this is a strong team here and, and uh, you know, we check and double check ourselves and we feel like that's pretty legit. Michael's speed is good enough to beat out Dale Jarrett by three tenths of a second. Joe Nimichek, Sterling Marlin, and Darrell Waltrip round out the fastest five in overall winter testing results. With all of the preseason Monte Carlo hype behind them, the teams returned to Daytona International Speedway for Speed Weeks 1995. It was Dale Jarrett the fastest, Dale Earnhardt the master, trying to win his first Daytona 517 career starts. On qualifying day, they backed up their reputations. Jarrett won the Bush pole, Earnhardt starting outside of row number one, missing the pole by 11 one thousandths of a second. On Thursday of Speed Weeks, it was the Gatorade Twin 125 five qualifying races, Earnhardt ran off with his event while Sterling Marlin won his. And that brought us to race day. The Dale and Dale show in front of a packed grandstand here at Daytona. Those two men led them to the start finish line to begin the 1995 season. It's Dale Earnhardt who storms out to take the early lead as Jarrett slips back. But Sterling Marlin chose the muscle that gave him a win earlier in the week, and he gets by Earnhardt on lap three. Marlin proves to be strong as he goes on to lead the next 26 laps until an equally strong Jeff Gordon takes over the top spot. The two swap the point back and forth until the rain starts to fall and the race is red flag for the next hour and 45 minutes, giving some a chance to catch a little rest. 
when the racing resumes, things look great for Gordon as he holds the point until lap 98. This Todd Bodine spin brings out the seventh caution of the afternoon when the leaders pick. The jack fails on the 24 car, damaging the left front fender, which knocks Gordon and the DuPont team out of contention. It's also a frustrating day for Rusty Wallace. On lap 160, Randy LaJoy wrecks on the backstretch. Then as the yellow flag starts to fly and cars start to slow, Rusty gets tangled up with Bobby Hamilton. His afternoon is over with yet another disappointing Daytona finish. This time, he comes home 34th. I can't believe it. I mean, a caution flag's out. We're coming to the caution flag, and the guy never lifts. He's wide open, crashing in there. I mean, what's this, four in a row? Probably about seven or eight, it seems like. But every time I come here, I got a good car, and some idiot runs over me. Dale Earnhardt takes over the lead after a round of pit stops and keeps it for the next 17 circuits. But quickly, Marlin shoots by Earnhardt, entering turn three with 19 laps to go. As Earnhardt starts to backpedal, dropping to fourth. But then, with 11 laps remaining, Bobby Labonte, running fifth at the time, spins between turns one and two, bringing out the final caution. And while the rest of the leaders stay on the track, Earnhardt gambles. He comes in for four new tires and fuel. The stop puts Earnhardt in 14th with only 10 laps remaining, and the charge is on. After only one lap, the Intimidator cuts the field in half as he makes it all the way to seven. Two laps later, he picks off fourth. Then he knocks off Dale Jarrett for third with five to go, and Mark Martin with three to go. But that's where the charge ends, as Earnhardt, new tires and all, cannot catch Sterling Marlin, who goes on to win the Daytona 500, becoming only the third driver to win that prestigious event back to back. I ain't never won the Daytona 500. And you still ain't. I ain't going to Disney World either. <laughs> he was strong, wasn't he? Yeah. I, I, if I'd had a little help, I could have rattled him. I was better than he was through the corners, but he was better than I was down the straightaway. We put a little extra tape on there and got to run a little warm. But... Hey. It's the Daytona 500. I ain't supposed to win the damn thing. <laughs> hey, how in the world did you come back from? Where did you start? About 12th on that restart? I don't know. 15th or so. Bush clashing it. You know, about eight laps ago, he said he's coming hard. And uh, I looked in the mirror about five to go when here he was. So uh, just hung on to it and made it here. After a disappointing effort at Daytona, Jeff Gordon and his Rainbow Warriors rally to take the pole for the Goodwrench 500 at Rockingham. Gordon's DuPont car is strong and is rarely challenged for the top spot. But after starting 21st, Dale Earnhardt makes a run to the front as he takes the lead from Gordon on lap 84. The worst incident of the afternoon comes on lap 177, when Jimmy Hensley, in his first ride for the active motorsports team, takes a hard lick from Greg Sachs. Both drivers are done for the day, but both walk away. Rusty Wallace's early season bad luck continues as he goes home early with a blown engine. He finishes 24th. Meantime, no one can catch Jeff Gordon as he leads 329 of the 492 laps to collect the third win of his young career, his first ever at The Rock. And because of his start first, finish first effort, Gordon picks up a $91,200 bonus from Unical, making his total payday better than $167,000. A snowy Friday cancels all opening day activities at Richmond, but Jeff Gordon remains hot, capturing the pole on Saturday for the Pontiac Excitement 400. His stay up front doesn't last, however. Rusty Wallace takes over the top spot on lap two and goes on to dominate the next 97 laps. Then Gordon's problems get worse. The fuel pump on the DuPont Chevrolet goes bad. That knocks Gordon out of contention with only 60 laps completed. After starting 26th, Dale Earnhardt takes the lead on lap 99. But Rusty Wallace doesn't let the Intimidator get away as the two duel it out, swapping the lead back and forth eight times over the next 23 laps, thrilling the sellout crowd at the Richmond Fairgrounds. Dale Jarrett's hopes for a third straight top five finish go flat when he runs over a part of Ford Burton's exhaust system. 
He takes Robert Presley into the wall with him. Jarrett finishes 25th, Presley 35th. On the final caution of the afternoon, Terry Labonte wins the race off pit road with a fast stop from Gary Dehart and the boys. And that puts the Kellogg's machine out front for good as the elder Labonte shows the strength he'd been hiding all afternoon as he puts away both Earnhardt and Wallace to make it two straight at Richmond. With the win at Richmond, Terry Labonte leaps from 12th to 4th in NASCAR Winston Cup point standings, with Dale Earnhardt continuing to hold on to the top spot. A beautiful weekend greets the crowd at the Atlanta Motor Speedway, where the story is, again, the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Chevy making it a clean sweep of the top five spots in qualifying, with Dale Earnhardt starting on the pole. It doesn't take long for the action to get going. Before Mike Wallace even takes the green flag, he gets tagged by Jeff Burton, popping the inside retaining wall, making for a very short afternoon. When the race finally gets underway, Dale Earnhardt takes the early lead, but Jeff Gordon is right on his tail. Gordon briefly takes the lead, only to have Earnhardt take it right back in typical Ironhead fashion. But on lap 63, Gordon takes the lead outright and puts a clamp on the top spot for 250 of the next 266 laps. Scary moment for Jeremy Mayfield on lap 147. He takes a hard lick from Michael Waltrip. Despite two mangled race cars, both drivers are okay. With Gordon running away with the show, holding a 17 second lead, leave it to his teammate Kenny Schrader to bunch up the field on lap 300 with a spin in turn one. After pit stops, Bobby Labonte makes a big charge for Gordon's top spot, but after 13 laps of close battling, Labonte's charge falls just one-tenth of a second short as Jeff Gordon wins the Purelator 500, his second victory of 1995, making it four wins in four races for the brand new Chevrolet Monte Carlo. This thing was on the rail. Bobby gave me uh, a little bit of he got me pretty nervous there at the end of the race, but uh, you know we came here to Atlanta with the same car that we raced in uh, in Rockingham. It's an awesome car, man. We might have to take this thing everywhere. With an off weekend on the NASCAR Winston Cup schedule following Atlanta, a couple of drivers used the free time to plot their comeback schemes. At Darlington Raceway, Ernie Irvin, seven months removed from his horrible accident at Michigan makes his return to the track in his Bush Grand National Series car. And he promptly goes out and sets a new track record at one of the toughest places to run on the NASCAR Winston Cup schedule. Larry and me talked, and he said, well, where do you want to test that? I said, Darlington, and I said, because that's a hard place. And um, so I had a Bush car sitting here, and I um, figured that uh, the guys were coming down to test, and I figured I'd put this Bush car together and uh, just be able to come down here and be able to just run nonchalant. It's not really, we're not preparing for anything. It's not, not that we're going racing next week. And uh, it's just a matter of just doing some stuff. And, uh, you know, it's been seven months since my accident and uh, I'm ready to start doing some racing and uh, ready to, to start doing some testing and uh, find out what I can do. Meantime, at an equally tough Bristol Raceway in Tennessee, it's Chuck Bound making his return after last year's accident in Pocono, Pennsylvania. After 100 laps, Bound feels he's ready. And with the active motorsports team behind him, he makes his comeback at Darlington. Chuck gets a bit anxious on his qualifying lap, but after a couple of loops and no contact with the wall, he's able to smile about the whole thing. Yeah, not what I had in mind, but, you know, we had a few problems this morning in practice and, you know, only made about six laps before qualifying. And I just got a little too aggressive with it through the fourth turn there at Darlington, tried to flat foot it through four. I lifted in turn three, but I tried to run it wide open in turn four, and it just didn't quite make it. It, it, it almost did, but not quite. So we'll have to, it's not too bad, fortunately. We'll have to fix it real quick and try again tomorrow. So you got a grin on your face, though. <laughs> Having fun? Well, well I, yeah, I am.